Welcome to Mariner's Church. I am so glad uh, that we can worship together today. I believe God has an encouragement and a word for you today from his word. So there's a joke and it, and it goes like this. Three dudes, they walk into a therapist's office and the first guy, he sits down and he says, you know, therapist, I, I just need to express some of my, I just need to work through some of my childhood experiences. See, my, my dad, like I, I know that my dad loved me growing up, but you know, he, he provided for me and he took care of me, but he was so busy providing that, I just wasn't sure if he ever really cared about the details of my life. He just wasn't really involved. And so I feel messed up. The second guy in that moment says, well, I have the opposite problem. See, for me, when I was a kid, my mom, she was super involved with the details of my life. I mean, she was super engaged, but the problem is she also shared a lot of the details of her life. She overshared. And so as a kid, I lived with the burden, not just with my messed up life, but also her messed up life. And so I feel messed up. Then the third man, he says, well, I'm here because I'm the father of two adult sons who are really, really ungrateful. They are really ungrateful for the ways that their mom and dad provided for them and took care of them. And so, oh, I'm gonna mess these two sons up. You know, I share that it's a funny joke, but I wonder if that's how some of us experience God or maybe more accurately put, I wonder if that's how some of us experience and interpret what God is like. See, for some of us, for you, you have no problem believing in a God who is big and powerful and, and a God who provides. You have no problem believing that. I mean, after all, you believe, you know, he died for my sins. And so it's easy for you to believe that God is big and powerful and the provider. But where you have a hard time is believing that God is present in the details. You ever feel that way? where you know he's in control, he's sovereign, but you just, you're not sure if he knows what's really going on in your life right now, right? Where right now you might be wrestling with some transitions in your life. Maybe you're in between jobs or, or you're uh, thinking about another career or you're trying to decide what major to pick and you're just not sure. Hey, God, like, do, do you care? Do, do, do you know what's going on in my life right now? Maybe you're going through some relational uh, issues, or you're trying to patch some things together with a spouse or a friend, a parent, or a child, and you just wonder, God, I know you're really powerful, but do, do you know what's going on right now? Or maybe you just feel isolated and alone, and you're wondering, God, do you see what's happening right now? We know that he's big and powerful. We just don't know if he's present with us in the moment. Others of us, we interpret God the exact opposite way, don't we? Where we know God cares. We know he loves us. We know he, he is intimately acquainted with all of our ways. We just don't know if he's powerful and if he's really gonna come through in our circumstances right now, right? Uh, maybe you feel this way. You, you've lost a little bit of confidence in God's power in your life. Where you're saying, God, like uh, fi financially, are, are, you gonna, are you gonna come through here? God, relationally, is this actually gonna work out? God, my future, like, do you really hold the future in your hands? And so we believe that God is powerful, but we're just not sure if, gosh, he's, he's with us, but we're just not sure if he's gonna deliver. Sometimes it's almost like we can experience God a little bit like the seesawing of a scale, where sometimes it feels like God is powerful, then other times, it just feels like he's just present only and not powerful. And then in the next season, it might feel like he really, he cares, but we don't know if he can. And then in the season after that, we know that he can, we just don't know if he cares. Other times it feels like he's really able, but we just don't know if he's available. And then in the next season, he might feel like he's available, but we just don't know if he's, if he's able. He can, and then he just cares. He can, and then he just cares. And so sometimes the Christian life and our journey with God the Father, it can almost feel like an inconsistent path forward in our journey with God. 
And so the question that we need to ask and answer is, how do we know that our God at all times is both present and powerful simultaneously all the time? How do we know that he can and that he cares, that he's able and that he is available? Well, I think we can know because when we open the scriptures, we actually see instances where God is simultaneously both. And that's really good news for us because it speaks of precedence. You know, Hebrew says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if there's a portion in the scriptures where we see the attribute of God in a certain way, well, that must mean that's who he is today. And so our church, we're in a series right now, hearing from Jesus's final words from the cross. And the final words that we're gonna read today are gonna demonstrate that our God is simultaneously powerful and that he is fully present and that he cares. Here's what we read from John chapter 19, verse 25. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Now this scene is a, a remarkable scene that captures both that Jesus, that God cares and that he can, right? On the one hand, we see the power and really the majesty, the cosmic ability and, uh, and powers of God, don't we? I mean, here is Jesus on the cross. He is bearing the sins of the world. I mean, he, he is securing here the eternal future of his people. We see cosmic power that he's able, that he's powerful, that he can. And yet at the same time, in the same scene, we see that this Jesus, he cares. Even though he is bearing the sins of the world, he in that moment at the same time, he has the presence of mind to care for his mother. He cares for Mary. We have to know that uh, in this moment, Mary, his mom, his mother, she is so vulnerable. She's so vulnerable. Some say that in this moment, Mary is maybe in her late 40s or early 50s at a time when people say that the average lifespan was 35 years old. She also had little to no income. In a male dominated society, she could not own property. She could not defend herself in the court of law. She, her husband had passed away, she's a widow. And now her son, her oldest son was passing away. The very person who is a controversial figure in a time with all the religious elite. So Mary here is in an incredibly vulnerable situation. And yet Jesus sees, he knows, he is present and available and he cares for her, even in the midst of bearing the weight of the world's sins. He has the presence of mind to say, mother, this disciple, the one I love, John, John the apostle, John the disciple, he is going to care for you. He is going to protect you and ensure your future. In this moment, we see both that Jesus is powerful and yet, He's present. Now, if the wow factor hasn't hit you yet, uh, it will once we start zooming out a little bit uh, because uh, we find these words in the gospel of John, in the gospel of John. You know, we have four accounts, four accounts of the life of Jesus. Now, the entire story of the Bible is about Jesus, but we have four accounts specifically of Jesus's life and ministry. We have the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Luke, and the gospel of John. Well, only John's gospel records this moment. This moment of Jesus on the cross caring for his mom is only recorded in John's gospel. It's unique to John alone. And here's why I find this so fascinating. Because of all, four, of all the four gospels, it's John's gospel, the gospel that we just read, it's John's gospel that highlights it amplifies, it celebrates as not just one idea or theme, but as one of its core themes, 
the divine nature of Jesus, that Jesus is God. I mean, all the gospels, all four gospels highlight this truth, but John's gospel celebrates this more than any other gospel. We know this, by the way, uh, from the way that each gospel starts. Every other gospel, it starts in a very humble, human and family way. Like, here's what I mean. Matthew's gospel, it starts with Jesus's genealogy to trace Jesus back to his family line of Abraham. Mark's gospel, it starts with the ministry of Jesus's cousin, John the Baptist. Luke's gospel, it starts with the relationship and friendship between uh, Mary and Elizabeth, Jesus's mom and John the Baptist's mom. But John's gospel, it starts out totally differently. Here's how it reads in John chapter one, verse one. It reads, in the beginning, in the beginning was the word, the logos. This is describing Jesus before he came into the world. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God the father. And the word, he was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Jesus. And apart from Jesus, not one thing was created that has been created. Isn't this a drastically different introduction to who Jesus is? See, John's gospel is unapologetic to display that Jesus is the self uh, existent, self sustaining, all powerful, no beginning, no end God. And yet, John's gospel is the one gospel that demonstrates that as Jesus is dying on the cross, bearing the cosmic weight of our sins, he also is the one who lovingly in that moment cares for his mom. See, Jesus, in the person of Jesus, we, we see both. We see that Jesus is powerful, and yet at the same time, he's, he's fully present. Our Jesus, he can and he cares. He is able and he is available. Christian thinkers throughout history have used fancy language uh, to describe this. They have said that God, on the one hand, he is transcendent, meaning he is distinct from creation. He is big, he is massive, or as my kids say, he's huge mongus. He's transcendent. And yet at the same time, he's imminent. He's imminent. He is involved with his creation. In fact, he's intimately involved. He's intimately acquainted with all of our ways. He's simultaneously transcendent and imminent. He's both. He's both. So if the scriptures make it so clear that he's both, why do we have, a, why do we have such a hard time not just believing it, but experiencing it for ourselves? Well, I have a theory. And my theory is, it's because there's nothing else in this world that is simultaneously both at the same time. I mean, we, we have things that are transcendent, we have things that are imminent, but we don't, we don't really have anything else in this world that's simultaneously both at all times. I mean, think about the ocean. The ocean is transcendent, but the ocean doesn't care about me. Or as a father, I can give my kids a Band-Aid, I'm imminent, but I can't, I can't forgive their sins, I'm, I'm not transcendent. So there's nothing in our world that we can kind of compare God to. It almost seems foreign. And this is why I believe uh, not only that we have a great longing for it, we have a craving for it, but I think this, is, this explains the rise and the explosion of, of superhero movies like the Avengers. Let me, let me kind of give you an example. See, superhero movies, they actually capture our imagination of both. It's superheroes that are transcendent, but also imminent, right? In fact, I, I wanna kind of ask for some audience involvement in this moment. I, I, I'm gonna invite you to say something out loud. On the count of three, I want you to say who you think is the greatest created fictional superhero of all time. You ready? Think about it for a moment. On the count of three, you, you're gonna shout it and you're gonna be proud of it, ready? One, two, three. The answer is Superman. The an Superman, super I went to Bible school. Like I paid a lot of money to go to seminary it's, it's Superman. He's the goat of all superheroes. In fact, I, I wanna give you some, some factoids. I've done some research. So here's some interesting facts about Superman. Superman, he can fly to another solar system in a matter of seconds. He once flew around the earth so fast 
that he broke the space-time continuum and actually reversed time. For some reason, I felt like an ultra nerd when I said that line. Um, also, he can run at light speed. At top speed, Superman is invisible. He is able to cross over continents in seconds. He can also hear things from outer space while standing here on Earth. His eyesight is so great, he can see individual DNA strands. He's so strong that he can, he wants to pull the core and crust of the Earth to stop an earthquake. He once lifted a continent. This is going to blow your mind. He once lifted a continent and he threw it into outer space with a piece of kryptonite stuck in his back. And this one's my favorite. He once destroyed a solar system with a sneeze. God bless you, Superman. Utterly transcendent. And yet at the same time, he's imminent, right? I mean, he grew up on a small little town called Smallville on a farm. He is a reporter for, a, for the Daily Planet. He works in a little cubicle and wears glasses. He loves his mom, Martha, and he has a crush on Lois Lane, imminent. And so our culture has been fascinated. Superman has been mainstream for 50 years because he's captured our imagination of what it can look like when transcendence and eminence collide together. This is why the comics have called him, uh, described him as a God among men. A God among men. But our Jesus, the creator of the world, theologians have described him as the God-man. As the God-man who is both utterly transcendent creator of the heavens and the earth, able to bear our sins. And at the same time, he's eminent. He's both. He cares about the details of our lives. You know, as you're listening, some of us, we are, we're going through some changes in our lives right now. Uh, we are in between jobs and you're kind of waiting for that company to call you back and you haven't heard back yet. And so there's some worry in your heart and you need to know that your transcendent God, he sees you right now. He notices you. He cares about you. You are not alone. He cares about you. Others of us were wrestling through this uh, relational conflict that, that kind of erupted recently. I mean, it maybe started out with uh, like an awkward text message exchange and uh, it got kind of quiet for a little bit and then someone started to get a little passive aggressive and there was that one fight and it blew up and, and you sat in your room alone and you were so discouraged and you need to know God sees you. He cares about you. He cares about that relationship. He cares about you. Others of us, we're, we're in crisis right now. We're saying, I, I don't know how I'm gonna pay, uh, pay the bills next month. I, I don't know what's gonna happen. Or she filed for the, uh, the, the divorce. Or you thought he'd be out of the hospital by now, but he's still in the hospital and the doctors are, are saying, we don't know what's gonna happen. And you're saying, does God notice? He does. Your heavenly father who is all powerful sees you. He cares for you. He notices you. He cares about you. He cares about you. But there's someone right now, as you're tuning in, you're saying, thank you. I, thank you for that encouragement. I believe that. But, but why doesn't he do something about it? I mean, I mean he's transcendent. He's, he's all powerful. So, so why doesn't he change the circumstances? Why doesn't he? And what, what he does oftentimes, he did for Mary. He took care of Mary. And there are countless stories of God changing the circumstance to care for us. And here's uh, one, of my, my, one of my favorites. Um, uh, there's a missionary uh, in England of the 19th century. His name was George Mueller. And he's most known for his work with uh, orphanages. And he has some remarkable stories about how God cared for him and cared for the orphans that he served. There's so many uh, incredible stories of God caring to the smallest detail, but this one is, is one of my favorites. Uh, but the story goes that um, they, the orphanage, they had run out of food. And so one morning for breakfast, 300 orphans are in the dining hall and there's no food, there's no food. And so 
Mueller, he, he stands before the children and he says, we're gonna give thanks, we're gonna pray right now and give thanks for the food. He was gonna give thanks for the food that wasn't there. And so he leads the orphans in prayers, they say amen, and they just wait in that dining hall. The story goes, which is well-documented, story goes that there's a knock at the door in that moment and, and the baker walks in and he says, Mr. Mueller, I could not sleep last night for some reason and I just got the sense that I was supposed to bake a lot of bread for, for your orphanage and so would it be all right if I could bring it in? He brings in the bread. Minutes later, there's another knock on the door and, and it was the milkman. And he said, hey, you know, my, my cart broke outside and by the time I get the wheels all fixed up, all the milk's gonna spoil. And so could you use just a, a ton of milk? And so that is just an example. It's an incredible story of how God, even to the smallest detail, sometimes he does change our circumstances. In fact, Mueller went on to say that God answered 50,000 of his prayers. So yes, God does change our circumstances. He cares for us by changing the things around us. But you're saying, yeah, but what about when he doesn't? How come he doesn't change the circumstances sometimes? That's a really good question. And it might be, it might be that when God doesn't change our circumstances, it's not that he doesn't care about us. It may be that he's caring for us in a different way. We actually see this in our passage today because in our passage, there was another character. We talked about how God cared about Mary, but there was a second character. It was the disciple whom Jesus loved. It was John. You know, John's day was really fascinating that day. You know, sometimes we, we go out and, hey, there was this cat or this dog and we just brought it home. John went home that day with a mom. John brought a mom home that day. I mean, in verse 27, it reads this way. Then Jesus said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, from that moment, the disciple took her into his home. So, John's life changed that day. Now, what I'm about to share, it's really fascinating, but it is from the argument of silence, but follow me on this journey. It's super fascinating. So let's fast forward the story for a little bit for John. Jesus resurrects prior to his ascension back into heaven. He calls his disciples in Matthew 28, and he gives them the great commission to go and make disciples of all the nations. Do you know who's there? John the apostle is there. Then we fast forward to Acts chapter two. The Holy Spirit falls at Pentecost. 3,000 men, not including women and children, they give their lives over to Jesus. The birth of the Christian movement has started. Do you know who's there? John is there. Acts uh, chapter three and four, we find a miraculous healing. Then these disciples are brought before the religious leaders and these men of faith and courage resist the religious authorities. Do you know who's there? John is there. We fast forward a little bit more to Acts 8. The Christian movement is exploding beyond just Jerusalem. The gospel is now moving into Samaria. John is there. But after that, John almost disappears from the scenes. Christianity is exploding. And one of the disciples, in fact, one of the disciples who was in Jesus's inner circle is not present. Where is he? In fact, one scholarly work, it's, it's a Bible encyclopedia, uh, described it this way, described John this way, that John, he was a prominent member of the Jerusalem church when Paul visited it later. Nothing further is known about John until according to church tradition, he was an elder at Ephesus. So you have Christianity blowing up and exploding and John, this is the one that Jesus loved. This was in Jesus' inner circle. He was a prominent member in the church and yet he's nowhere to be found. Where is John in the story? Could it be that John was kind of busy taking care of Jesus' mom? Helping her with what? Go to the groceries? Help her to use the bathroom? Keep the house tidy? And I just wonder if there was ever a time when John thought, you know, like Jesus, like I know you're in heaven right now. It was great when we were hanging out for like three and a half years and I trust you, I trust your judgment. But like, you know, like I was with you for three and a half years. I'm gonna write Bible soon. Um, and so 
Like I could be really effective for kingdom work out there. Like Paul, this new guy, he's like crushing it out there. And I just think I could be also effective out there, but I don't know why you put me in this circumstance where like, I'm like, you know, I love your mom and I want to take care of her, but like I could do something. Again, I trust your judgment, but like if you could just change my circumstance here, I could really be effective for your glory out there. Cause you know, anyone could take care of your mom, but no one, not anyone could write the Bible. And I just wonder if John ever felt this tension of, why won't he just change my circumstances? So why didn't he change John's circumstances? Maybe it's because Jesus was more interested in changing something else. Not just John's circumstances, but John's character. Not not just John's scenario, but, but John's soul his heart, the condition of his heart. See, God sometimes will change our circumstances to care for us. But other times he will care for us by not changing the circumstances, but leveraging the circumstances to change us. I I actually think we see this with John. You know, early on um, in John's life, when he meets Jesus, wow, he is he's a mess. Like he's a very fascinating guy. Like he has anger issues. He's vindictive. He's, he's got some issues. How do I know that? Do you know what Jesus' nickname was for John and his brother James? Son of thunder. Okay. You have anger issues if Jesus calls you the son of thunder. If he's like, you know, you kind of remind me of that thing that I created that makes a lot of noise and sounds really angry. You guys have a lot of parallel. You have issues, right? Like he's not, in fact, uh, in one account in the gospels, Jesus ministers in Samaria. That town, they reject Jesus. And John's response is, hey, Jesus, like, should we call down fire from the skies? That's not a normal response. Like, you don't want to get John to volunteer at VBS. That would not go well at this year's VBS, right? Oh, and by the way, um, don't you love the self-serving title that he gives gives himself? He wrote the Gospel of John and he titled it, what should I call myself? Uh, The Disciple that Jesus loves, that's just delicious. It's a first century selfie. And yet, towards the end of John's life, he's the longest standing apostle. Later on, the role that he would play for the churches in Asia Minor was really that of a, a father figure for the churches. You know what's fascinating? Do you know how he writes if you read 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, towards the end of his life? He, he, he talks like this, he talks like this. Oh, my, my children, my, my little children, beloved, let, let's forgive one another. Let's forgive one another. Wait, where did, the, where did the son of thunder go? In fact, do you know what historians call John? They call him the apostle of love. How in the world did the son of thunder become the apostle of love? Could it be from those years where he was spending time with Jesus' mom? It was almost like the gentleness and the tenderheartedness of Jesus' mom kind of rubbed off on John a little bit. It was almost as if the circumstantial constraint that John found himself in was used and leveraged to change John's soul to make him more tender and soft-hearted I wonder who needed who more. Mary needed John, all right. She needed protection. But I wonder if John, maybe he needed Mary more. See, God, he will sometimes care for us by changing the circumstances around us. Other times he will care for us by not changing the circumstances around us, but using those circumstances to change us. So John was right. He was the disciple that Jesus loved. And Jesus loved him by working a change in him. As you're tuning in, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've trusted in Jesus, you are a disciple. You are a disciple that Jesus loves. And nothing, nothing's gonna get in the way of him caring for you. Nothing is gonna derail his love for you. See, he's gonna care for you today one way or another. He's gonna care for you by changing the circumstances in your life, or he's going to care for you by leveraging the circumstances in your life to work a profound change in you. That's your reality in this moment. 
See, some of us, you might be in the biggest storm of your life. You are in the biggest storm of your life and you're saying, is that really true? Does Jesus, does God really care about me in that way? Can that really be true? Others of us, you're tuning in and you are, you are, you just feel like a spiritual mess. You're like, I've just messed up royally. And even what I did the other day, I'm so ashamed. Is that really true? Yes, he cares for you. And here's how you and I today in this moment, without a shadow of a doubt, can know that he cares for you. By the same way, John and Mary knew that day that Jesus cared for them. By looking up and beholding the one who hung on the cross for our sins. And here's what we'll find, that you and I, we have a father and he is a gracious father. He is not a father who is so busy providing that he does not know what's going on in your life. He's also not the father who loves to, to hang out with us and have a good time with us, but is unable to provide for us because he's not powerful. No, our God is both. Our father, he is able and available. He cares and he can. He's powerful and he's present and he's with you now. And he sent his son, his only begotten son, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his son for you and I. And he changes our circumstances. He does. He makes us right with himself. But he also works a change in us, doesn't he? He gives us the Holy Spirit. He adopts us and we are brought into his family. The one who carried the cross cares about your circumstances and your character. That's true of you in this moment because of Jesus. The one who carried the cross, he cares about your circumstances and your character. That's good news for all of us. And it all comes from Jesus's final words on the cross. In view of this incredible truth, I wanna invite you to move into a time with me of communion. Communion is the moment where we get to remember what he has done for us. Communion is a beautiful picture really of God's transcendence and eminence. He's transcendent, he's all powerful. Only he could bear the sins of the world. He could only, only he could bear your sins and my sins. And yet he's imminent. He entered our world. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what uh, it's like to experience chaos in the world. And yet he obeyed perfectly for you and for me. And so at this time, we're going to partake of the elements together. On the night of Jesus' betrayal, Jesus, he took bread and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Let's take, let's eat together. Then he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of my covenant which is poured out for the forgiveness of, of sins. Let's take and let's drink. I wanna invite you right now where you are, you can stand, you can kneel, but let's take on a posture of worship for our God. He is so good. He cares about you right now. And so let's respond with joy, celebration, and gratitude. Let's worship our God together.